Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. Security is a very important topic when it comes to programming and especially when we program ASP.NET Core Web APIs. However, we tend to overlook certain concerns regarding security in our day-to-day -day development. So to make your life easier, I wanted to create this video in which I will provide you an ASP.NET Core Web API security checklist that you can always have in mind when developing ASP.NET Core Web APIs. First of all, I want to make clear that I didn't reinvent the wheel here. When it comes to topics around security, a default go-to resource for everybody should, should be OWASP. If you don't know, OWASP is a non-profit organization that is focused on application security. And they invest a lot of time and resources in doing different research on security, on different aspects of security in our day-to-day -day applications. So in this video, I would like to start from the OWASP top 10 API security vulnerabilities. And I want to focus only on those that I think are really important when it comes or when applied specifically to ASP.NET Core Web APIs. At the beginning, there are two vulnerabilities that are very important and they are quite similar in certain ways. So first of all, we have what it is called broken object level authorization. And the main point here in this vulnerability is that we might allow attackers to get access to information that they shouldn't be able to access. So let's imagine this scenario. Here we have an in-memory repository and we have a list of users and we have user ID 1 and user ID 2. And then we have a list of shops and each shop has the revenue information. And obviously each shop also has an owner, so therefore we have the owner ID 1 and here for this shop we have owner ID 2. So we can imagine as this scenario being a marketplace where we host different shops and then the shop owners, they are allowed obviously to check the revenue information for their specific shop. So let's move over to Postman and let's do a request. So here we have a get, we have shops, then the ID of the shop and then revenue. Here I get the result. This is the shop name and this is the revenue. Now let me show you one thing. If I move over to jot.io, we see that we have a JSON web token, we have this user ID 1. So we assume that the authenticated user for this instance is 1. Now let's come back to Postman and tweak here the query. As a shop owner, I can, for instance, say, okay, I see that the application does this query, but what revenue does other shops have? And I can easily get a list of other shops than using maybe an other endpoint that returns all the shops. So I will just come here and replace this two or replace this one with a two, and then I will execute the request. And in this case, I can see that I can see this information for this shop and I can see the revenue information. And obviously I shouldn't be able to do that because I am only the owner of the first shop but not the owner of the second shop. To solve this security vulnerability, we obviously need to implement a check that I am only available or I am only allowed to view the revenue information for the shop I am an owner. And to do this, the easiest way is to do this via authorization and to use policies. And in this case, we would like to create a policy that would require that I am the shop owner. So only if I'm the shop owner, I am allowed to actually see the revenue information. And the easiest way to implement this is to create simply a new security requirement. So I will create this new class and I will add this shop owner requirement. Now, to be able to wire this up with the ASP.NET Core authorization, we will make this class inherit this I authorization requirement. The thing is that we don't need any other information in this class right now, so we will leave it empty. Then we'll also need a handler that will handle this requirement and perform the, appro the appropriate checks. So I created this new class, which is shop owner handler. And to wire this up with the requirement that we have just created, we simply need to inherit this authorization handler of shop owner requirement. In order to do this, I will need to have access to this app repository that we have in memory. And I have wired it up to the DI container so I can request it in the constructor of this class. As part of the authorization handler inheritance, I would then need to also implement this protected override on handle requirement async. And here in this handle requirement async, we get this authorization handler context and we get the shop requirement, which is the requirement that we have just created. Now, if we want to pass information to the requirement, we can do this when we will add the policy. But in this case, or in our case, we don't really need other information. We just need the logic to actually perform this type of check. So obviously, what we want to have here is we get an access to the HTTP context. 
And from the HTTP context, we can obviously get this shop ID from the route values. And then if that shop exists, what we need to do is we need to get the user ID that we have in the token as a claim. And then we need to get the shops and then do just a simple comparison if I am the owner of the shop that I would like to try to access. Only if I am the owner, then I will set this context, succeeded, and then requirement, and then I will return this task completed task. Otherwise, if I'm not the owner, this context will not succeed, and therefore I should get back an unauthorized. Now I'll go back to the program.cs class, and then I will also add here an authorization policy. So it's on builder services add authorization, and on the option, I say that I want to add a policy. I call this policy shop owner, and by the way, I guess I'll need to copy this. And then policy requirements add and I add the newly created or my own requirement, which is this shop owner requirement. The last thing that I need to do is to also add my authorization handler to the DI container so that it will be able to pick it up when we need to validate this requirement. Now, let me go back to this shop controller and here we have this revenue. So I will add here authorize and in the authorize, I'll say that the policy equals and I'll give the name of my policy. Now, let me run the application again and I'm back to Postman and I want to do the request once again. So the shop is two and I am user ID one and as user ID one, I am not an owner for this second shop. So if I run the request right now, you see that I get back a 403 forbidden. So I have fixed this security vulnerability in my API. Very similar to this is also the second security vulnerability that I would like to talk about. And this is the so-called function level authorization or broken function level authorization. In the previous example, we have seen that initially we could access revenue information for shops that didn't belong to us. But we had access to that endpoint, so that was no problem with our access to the endpoint itself. There was a problem with the access to certain information, or we should be able to see only the information in our shop. However, this broken function level authorization is when we can access methods that we are not supposed to access at all. So let's take a look into how we could exploit this in a practical example. For this one, let's imagine the following scenario. We created an application and the access to this application or users can create accounts in this application only based on certain invites. So we might have some admins that will create some invites for certain people. And if we go here to our app repository, we see that also we have a list of invites and there is also an invite, create, an invite created with ID 1 and the role admin and a certain username. And we have this invite controller. And the application flow is that I'm trying to register now to the application from my phone, for instance. And during this process, what I do is that I need to get my invite. So let me go back here. So we have this get on invites and with the ID one. And then I will get this invite back, which contains the ID, the username and the role. What an attacker might do here would say, okay, what are some common patterns in API? So we see that we get, we have this get endpoint that gets us an invite. But what if there is a post endpoint in which I am able to create my own invite and then go through this registration process? So for instance, let's move this to post. Then we do the post directly on the invites because this is a usual pattern that we have. And we specify here the username and the role. And the username is very suggestive in this case. So let me go click here on send. We see that this was created, the invite. And if I go back here and say invites and then with the ID two and click send, obviously we also need to change the request. And we see that we get our invite back. So having or having this broken function level authorization as an attacker, I was just able to create my own invite for this application. So let's try to fix that. We can fix this problem also by working on the authorization. So let's go back here to the program.cs and here we already have this policy that we have added earlier. Now we know that it did post to this invite, only admins of the application are able to create this type of invite. So what if we just add here let me just also stop the server. So what if we just adhere this admin only as a policy and here we require that a certain role is present of our, on our token and that role is admin. And obviously 
on the token that I have right now, I don't have this admin role. The next thing that we need to do is obviously to come here and also enforce this. So we'll have authorize and then policy and the name of the policy is admin only. So let's run the application again and let me check if I can still create my own invite. So let's switch this to post, let's delete the ID here and let's send a request. And once again, we have 403 forbidden, which means that right now I cannot create my own invite as an attacker so we have mitigated this vulnerability. So generally to make sure that we guard ourselves against this vulnerability there are a few things that we can take into consideration. First of all we could aim at implementing system with least access privilege. So theoretically by default nobody has access to anything and each access needs to be given explicitly. Then another possible mitigation would be to really make sure that we do a lot of checks on each administrative entity points so that we make sure that only administrators or only staff that is allowed are supposed to perform certain actions. Another possible mitigation is to implement also group membership checks in regular functions or in regular methods, not only on administrative controllers, so it would be something like we have done in our example right now. The next vulnerability I would like to talk about is a very popular one, although I think that in the ASP.NET Core stack, if you're using kind of like the default technology, we shouldn't be really exposed too much at this type of vulnerability, and this is SQL injection. I would say that we are generally pretty safe when we are using Entity Framework Core, because Entity Framework Core uses parameterized queries whenever we have SQL, even in the row SQL or from row SQL methods. To see how SQL injection works, we are not using Entity Framework and we are using the regular SQL client SQL connection instead. So I want to briefly walk you through what we have here. Now we want here to get all users, but we have also a filtering criteria that we will take in as a query and that will be the user ID. And then what we do here is, okay, we use the connection string to my local server, which is the SQL Server Express. And then I am creating an SQL connection with that connection string and I am opening this connection. And then I have to build my my own query and I say here select all from DBO users where user ID equals and then I will specify directly the user ID that I get here and then I will execute this reader this command and then I will return okay because I'm not interested to what this returns and just want to showcase how SQL injection works also in the database to showcase we have this table which is DBO users also, we have this breakpoint here to take a look into what exactly our query will look like. So let's debug the application. And here I have already prepared this query string, which is this user ID equals. And there is here some URL encoded stuff. Now, let me click here on send and we will examine exactly how this string would look like once it is decoded. Okay, so we are here right now. And if we take a look at this string, we see that it select from DBO users where user ID equals one. And then I have this semicolon and then I have this drop table users. So let me continue to run this and let me go back to SQL and I will simply do a refresh here and bang, my DBO users table is gone. It's not here anymore. And that, my friends, is how SQL injection works and how bad it could be. So how do we solve this problem? And the thing is, or the problem here is that we get directly the user input and we add it here to the string as an interpolation. Now, every time that we work with SQL, we need to create parameterized queries, not blank queries like this. So how do we do that? First of all, we will need here to come in our string and we will replace this user ID with this at and user ID. Then on the command that we have created, we can add parameters with value. And I say that I want to add this parameter for user ID and the value for this parameter should be this specific user ID. Now let me run the application again and let's run the exact same request. So we still receive a 200 OK, but if we go back to the database and refresh, we can see that we still have this table DBO users. So just by parameterizing our SQL query, we have guarded ourselves against this SQL injection vulnerability. The second thing that you can do to guard against this type of attack to always sanitize this user input. So it means that before we pass this to our SQL query, we would perform a lot of checks on it and, and find out if it contains any type of value that might affect our overall application. 
So for now I have covered around 4 topics from the OWASP API security cheat sheet. I chose these topics because I think they are really important when it comes specifically to ASP.NET Core Web API development. I guess that's a wrap. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and like it and if you are for the first time here, hit also the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you are always notified when there's something new happening on this channel. And if you have any question or just want to get in touch with me, don't be shy and head over to the comment section and leave your comment I, and I would be more than happy to get in touch with you. Thank you very much for watching and until the next time, I wish you the very best.